Good evening and thanks for joining us on a cold and dark November night on an interesting and exciting topic and hopefully interesting and exciting evening. Um, pregnancy is always um, an upheaval and an interesting experience for women, but especially so with chronic diseases. And tonight we want to look into the uh, family planning experiences in, in women with IBD and my colleagues and I have uh, spent some time researching that, but the interesting bit is how to communicate what we found with the public and especially with patients and fellow healthcare professionals. And looking at art as a means of communicating research is, is a new way of doing it. And uh, the University of Wolverhampton is a bit of a pioneer in that. And hopefully you find tonight very interesting and we can all learn something from this. So we're gonna start off in a couple of minutes um, with my colleague, Helen Steed, from Wolverhampton taking us through the background of IBD, IBD and pregnancy in a bit where the research project came from. Um, my colleague Sati will then take us through um, what we've done in a bit more detail in the research together with Helen. And then we've got four exciting pieces of art that have been created that look at it all from a slightly different angle. And we really are interested in um, the different ways of looking at it and how interesting and um, thought provoking you find that. And we're going to finish then the, the evening with a panel discussions. And for that, we really want your views and questions. For that, there's a Q&A function on your Zoom. So at the bottom, you find several different buttons. And one is Q&A. That's the best way of asking questions. It works much better than in a chat. And we can keep an eye on that. So please, as we go along, post your questions in there. And we'll come to them all at the end. We're really keen on your views. Um, one of our colleagues, Becky, is also trying to actually research how art influences people, and she'd be very interested in your views after that. So feedback is really important. Um, we're also interested in reflective pieces, and there will be a prize for the best reflective piece by a trainee. Um, so you've all seen that with the invite, so we would be very much looking forward to your views there. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Helen, who's going to start us off on the background of the topic. And disease and ulcerative colitis are two forms of inflammatory bowel. Sorry. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Helen Steed, I'm a consultant gastroenterologist and my job this evening is to talk to you a little bit about inflammatory bowel disease. Some of you here are going to be healthcare professionals and you'll already know, and some of you will be patients and you will obviously already know, um, but there'll be people on this um, at this event who maybe perhaps don't have a full understanding of what the disease is, so I'm going to talk very briefly about it um, to put, things in, put, put the rest of this evening into a little bit of context for you. Uh, Crohn's and disease and ulcerative colitis are two forms of inflammatory bowel disease, and they are common. Uh, 300,000 people in the UK have either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, and that means every 30 minutes somebody in the UK is being diagnosed with the disease. And a whopping 25% of them, so a quarter of them, are um, children and under the age of 16. Treatments involve a whole range of medications, it might involve surgery and dietary changes. And the disease itself can cause symptoms with tummy pain, diarrhea, um, anemia when your red cell count is low, can feel very fatigued, people, people can have a depression and anxiety, they can get thin bones, lose weight, have mouth ulcers, joint pains, a whole host of, of symptoms. And the crucial part is there really isn't a cure. Um, and we don't know completely what causes it, but it is triggered by um, the genetics of an individual and then diet and bacteria within the, the gut. So there are kind of complex causes behind it as well. So what does that actually mean in practical terms? So this is a picture of a healthy colon. So as you can see, um, you can clearly see down the bowel, um, there are, the lining is nice and pink and pale. You can see all the blood vessels, clearly that's the little spidery red webs. Um, and, uh, and it looks wide open. So that's what it should look like. Now, if you've got Crohn's disease or osteoporosis, this may well be what it actually looks like. So completely different. 
you can see here the, the pink is a very bright, angry pink. Uh, now it's not that beautiful pale. Those blood vessels that we could see before, they've gone. They're not visible at all. And the white parts that you're seeing there also is an actually in the picture on the left, you can see that they're long, deep ulcers channeling down the bowel. So it's not very hard to imagine that somebody with that in their in their colon and their large bowel would might have pain from those ulcers. They would see blood um, in their stool. They would have diarrhea. They would feel unwell. If you had that on your arm, you would kind of know that your arm would hurt and you would feel unwell. But that is one of the issues with Crohn's disease and osteoclitis. It's really a hidden disability. So people can look quite well on the outside, but actually inside be very poorly. Um, but that makes it difficult to talk about and then compounded by the fact that it is, it is linked to positive bowels, which have very often considered to be a taboo subject, particularly in our British society, where we perhaps don't talk so openly about those things. So it can make it really challenging for people to talk and get support for, for their disease. Now, how do we look after? Well, these are just some examples of the medical pathways that we use to look after. And these are actually out of date because we have more drugs now. Um, so they're quite complicated, so that's quite a lot of information for doctors to understand, never mind um, anybody else. Um, and if the medicines don't work, then some people are going to go on to need surgeries, um, and that might um, involve having a stoma bag, which is when they bring the bowel from the inside of your tummy out onto the skin of the tummy wall, and you wear um, a, a bag over it, so the waste goes directly into the bag and then you enter the bag down the toilet. Um, instead of pooing through the bottom. So it's just a different way of pooing, but it's but obviously it's quite a dramatically different way of pooing if it's not something that you're, you're expecting or used to. And you can see from these pictures um, uh, that these people have got all different types of scars, but they're all patients who have, have had surgery in their, in their tummy for one reason or another. And that could occur at any time during the disease. So when we see patients with inflammatory bowel disease in a clinic appointment, these are some of the things that we're talking about. Um, and I'm sure you'll agree, it's probably not realistic to have an in-depth discussion about all of these things every time you see somebody when you've got a 15 minute appointment slot. And that includes having to read their notes in advance, do all the dictation and so on. So people can have problems with their mental health um, that might need exploring. They might have joint pains. You might need to talk to them about how trying to travel for their summer holiday. Um, and medications or vaccinations they can and can't have, the, the long-term risk of cancer for some patients, um, the, their energy levels and fatigue, how they're eating, um, if they're missing anything in particular in their diet, are their eyes affected by um, Crohn's disease, are they smoking, do they need to stop smoking, is their skin impacted, how's their bone health, and so on. So there's an awful lot to think about. And then when you throw into the mix the idea that most of these um, people who are diagnosed are young, so at some point, many of them may or may not want to start family. So what happens when you want to make that kind of decision and you bring into having this chronic illness where you can feel very poorly at times um, uh, with the concept of potentially becoming pregnant and then giving birth and having a baby? So there are a lot of things for people to consider um, and, and often until that decision sort of arrives on you. People aren't necessarily thinking about it too far in advance. Um, so when we undertake research, uh, so, we, so we just have to undertake research in this area and we looked at a, a project reviewing um, the, the medical literature to find out what was already known. Um, and, and it clearly identified that if people know more, they're better prepared. And you were more likely to know more if you'd spoken about this, about having a baby with a doctor, um, if you had a higher level of education, so you've been to university, and, and if you were younger when you were diagnosed, you've been living with the disease for longer. Um, but, uh, uh, and so the next step that we did was actually to talk to people. So we would talk to women and their partners um, before they had decided to become pregnant, when they were thinking about it, when they were actually pregnant, after they'd had a baby, and we spoke to a small number of women who had decided for one reason or another not to have a baby. So what do we do with those research results? Well, normally we communicate them like this. So this is how we communicate with other healthcare professionals at massive conferences with thousands of people, posters with huge amounts of medical information on them, and in large lecture theatres um, where people stand up and ask questions about your, your research and quiz you on it. And we publish in journals like this. 
Uh, so you can imagine that this is not the most accessible way to have information if you are not a doctor, a trained healthcare professional, and trained in interpreting and understanding this information. If you are somebody who's living with this condition, who's the person that actually needs to know the knowledge, this isn't the best way to communicate with people. And these are the people that we want to be communicating with, the, the patients who are um, members of Crohn's and Colitis UK, who, uh, who are not members of Crohn's and Colitis UK, um, the people that come and see us in clinic. And we know, unfortunately, that um, healthcare and wellbeing information is difficult for people to understand. So 61% of people in England find it difficult to understand information around health, um, their own health and wellbeing. Um, and it's probably not helped if it's presented in the formats that I've just shown you. Um, so what we really wanted to do um, with this project, as well as publish it in the medical class, is to um, present it in a way that's accessible to uh, patients and their families. And that is what tonight is about, it's about sharing that part of the, the research outcomes with you. So I'm going to be handing on to my colleague, um, Dr. Pruell, and she's going to be talking to you a little bit about the, the research and the psychology behind it. And then we're going to go on to um, show you what our artists have done. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed this evening. Thanks. Hiya. Thank you, Helen. I'm Saki Prewal, and I'm the, I'm the lead psychologist on this project, and I'm also work with the same team. I am living in silence project where we also use art to help disseminate research findings. So I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the research that we engaged in here and also talking about why we involved artists. Now there is actually a lot of research that's been done looking at IBD and pregnancy related factors. But the problem is not a problem, but the truth is a lot of that research is quite medical based, it's quite looking on medical factors or physiological factors. But what that research doesn't often do is look at actually, but how do women experience pregnancy? How do they experience motherhood? And for a significant minority of women who choose not to have children, why do they choose not to have children? What are their decision-making process in that? And we're interested to know that just to better help support these different groups of women. So what we did was we decided to interview four different groups of women. So the ones who decided not to have children, the ones who are trying to get pregnant, a group of women that were currently pregnant, and a group of women that were what we call postpartum, that they had a baby, and the baby was about one years old at that point. And we also interviewed some of their partners as well. And the main focus of that was to understand women's experiences. So how does IBD impact your uh, pregnancy related decisions, your family making decisions, and how does that impact your experiences? How do you experience motherhood, pregnancy, or not having children? And, and very reassuringly, what we found was actually patients tend to cope really well with IBD and whatever their pregnancy related decisions they decided to have. But one thing that most groups of participants are part of the patients wanted was a lot more information regarding the impact of IBD on their reproductive health. Now, this is, this in a, in a way is quite interesting because actually there's a lot of information out there on how IBD impacts someone's reproductive health and how it impacts pregnancy and your fertility chances. For example, Crohn's and colitis do some excellent um, patient-focused information sheets. But Again, the way that Helen talked about, the way that we academics researchers talk, we tend to talk about very factual language and factual terms. So we tend to use language like having IBD only slightly reduces your chances of fertility or something like that. But what we don't do is talk about patients' experiences, their emotions. So, and that's what these groups of patients wanted. They wanted emotional needs met as well as the kind of factual information that they wanted to. And I suppose this is where the artists came in, and this is led on to our initial project, Living in Silence, is that we as clinicians, psychologists, researchers, we are really skilled at giving those factual information. We do really great academic writing. But sometimes that, that 
style of writing doesn't best suit patient groups or a general population. That's because they have more needs than just knowing factual knowledge based uh, uh, information. What they have is they want some emotional needs as well met. And, and for that, we decided that actually it might be better to engage with artists and get them to help us disseminate our research findings, to sort of realize our findings, but do it in a different, exciting way that actually we decide that we will talk to our patients, we'll talk to our, those communities we care about, but we do it in a way that actually it puts their needs uh, uh, first. So what we're doing is communicating to them in a language that feels culturally relevant to them and that feels sensitive to their needs. So what we did was we uh, recruited a team of excellent artists and we gave them our interview transcripts and we told them to read up the transcripts and to do two things. One, to convey the kind of factual information that they that we felt that patients wanted and two, to also reflect participants of the patient's psychological experience of how they go through, how it IBD impacts their kind of family planning choices. So the aims of the project was one, to provide kind of relevant information to our uh, participants and also address the kind of emotional needs that this group might have. For example, look at tackle pregnancy-related concerns. So women and their partners feel supported within their family making decisions. So this is sort of like, I suppose we're piloting and we're testing a different sort of approach so what we call the arts and psychological health-based approach to engagement with the research, with the arts, to help disseminate um, research findings, but doing it, doing it in a way that actually talks straight to the communities. So what we're doing less is talking to e each other, to uh, other researchers, other academics or clinicians. What we're doing is we're getting better at talking to uh, patients, uh, the populations that we serve and we care about, but we're using it with the help of artists. Now, I'm going to pass on to one of our artists, Sol, who's going to be talking about what their role was in this project. Sol, is that okay? Hey, yeah. So um, firstly, I'm gonna introduce uh, Ray's work. So sadly, Ray can't be with us tonight, um, but Ray was a graphic designer on this project. She produced a leaflet, um, as well as a series of stickers and posters that's looking into family planning with Crohn's and Clias. Um, she based her work on the interview transcripts um, that we were that from the research, um, and these will be just distributed to patients. So I'm gonna hand over and so we can see her work now. Next, I'm going to introduce my film. So I'm Sorrel Mayon, the animator on this project. Um, so my film's called Family Planning with Crohn's and Clitus. It's an animated short looking into the lived experience of patients who are currently family planning. Um, the film was developed from 14 interview transcripts um, from the research. And I went through these, made notes and sketches and highlighted the key areas that we wanted to cover in the film. Um, I then worked closely with the team to write the script uh, and we produced a film that aims to inform and like Sati said, uh, support the patients and GPs about the research findings. I hope you like it and find it useful. That's my favourite part when after everything, the mum and baby visit the clinic. People have a lot of concerns, yeah. Pregnancy is hard enough without also having Crohn's or colitis. I 
I'd say the biggest concern for people is having a flare-up during pregnancy. But if couples can contact us before they conceive, it's ideal, as we can support them from the very beginning. A common worry is how mother's medication will affect their baby, so it's really important for women not to stop taking their medication before they consult their doctor. At the end of the day, a healthy mum gives the best chance for a healthy baby. Breastfeeding often causes concerns, but it's actually very safe. Most medications will simply be digested in the baby's stomach and be of no harm to them. I've seen a lot of couples brought closer together by IBD, especially during a flare-up. Although it may not do much for your sex life, knowing that your partner is there for you when you're at your lowest means a lot. But children aren't for everyone. Some couples want to focus on other parts of life, and women can find social pressures to have children difficult. So whatever your choice, come and talk to us. We're here to support you. We're now going to hear from Jess. Um, she's going to introduce her work and Paul's documentary. Hello everybody, my name is Jess Butcher. I'm a storyboard artist, writer and illustrator. Um, and I was commissioned by this wonderful group of people to produce a series of short comics about the experience of in a pregnancy with inflammatory bowel disease because there's many many different areas of those two things together there's not just one thing lumped in all in one there's many aspects so what i did was i read through the same transcripts that we all had and i also took notes and i found that there was a great deal of emotional impact that inflammatory bowel disease and pregnancy can have on a person both positive negative all those weird little emotions we don't exactly have the names for. And I thought it was wonderful to read these experiences of people. And it occurred to me that we don't often get to see that side of uh, medical issues. Um, there's, we talk, you know, we're starting to talk more about mental health and that's wonderful. And I found that it would be fantastic to not only include some of the more medical sides of things, but also include very heavily the emotional sides of things. And so from that, I, did six short comics, but because they're comics, they'll take a while to get through. So you can read all of them for free on CC UK's website as, as well as see the rest of our work um, after this or during this. But for now, what we do have is a small semi-animated video uh, where we, uh, thanks to Sorrel, who was very lovely and helped me because I didn't know what I was doing for this. She animated over the top of this while I did the voice acting and we'll be able to have a look at my illustrations while I narrate what's being said. So let me just quickly set that up and we can have a little look-see. Feel free to grab some popcorn because it's essentially a film. There we go, just getting everything set up. And now's the moment my computer decides to freeze, which is just fan dabby dozy, isn't it, everyone? Aha, here we go. All right, I think we can all see that. So enjoy everybody. Yes, there's no sound. Oh dear me, not sure why there's no sound. Uh, how about now? Yes, it might be because you've got headphones on. Maybe. What? Well, I'm not sure why that would make a video not have audio though. I can disconnect my headphones, see if that helps. All right, can you hear anything now? Yeah, just turn it up a little bit. All right, we're going back to the beginning, everybody. Hope everyone can hear this. Good morning, Fazia. Did you sleep well? Hi, Naomi. I didn't sleep very well, I'm afraid. Well, that's not surprising. You admitted dehydrated and severely inflamed last night. Yeah, that really pushed me to finally come in. Oh, well, how long have you been in discomfort? So, 
Naomi, if you have time, can I ask you some questions about differentiating between my pregnancy and my colitis? Of course you can. Well, once I found out I was pregnant, I had a few weeks of bloating and digestive pain, which is pretty standard of my mild flare-ups. But as I kept going, it got more and more painful. How would you rate the pain on a scale of one to 10? Most of the time it was a five. I could still move and do my daily work, but I got really tired really often and it was getting hard to focus. Sometimes it was an eight or possibly a nine. Oh, wow. That must have been very difficult to manage. Yeah, I was going to the toilet maybe 15 times a day and there was a lot of blood. Sorry, was this recent or earlier in your pregnancy? It's been like this for two months. You've known you were pregnant for only three months. What stopped you from coming to the hospital sooner? I don't know. I suppose I just assumed this was a normal thing to experience when you live with a chronic illness. I felt like I had to tough it out. Otherwise, I was just being lazy. Fosia, it's normal for colitis to continue into pregnancy, but that doesn't stop it from being colitis. Discomfort, pain, and flares are exactly the same as they were before, and both need and deserve the same treatment. <laughs> I know, I know. I feel rather silly now. You're not silly at all. It sounds to me like we've failed to properly inform you of how your pregnancy and colitis will interact. No, you've been great. I've really appreciated all you've done. Still, clearly we haven't explained the differences between pregnancy discomfort and colitis discomfort. If you like, we can talk about that now. Well, okay then. When should I be concerned about my colitis symptoms during pregnancy? Just like how your colitis experience will be different from everyone else's, so will your experience with the disease while pregnant. Essentially, it all boils down to how you're feeling in your own body. If you know that the bloating hurts but won't affect your day, take it easy and do your best. But if you're curled up in agony and it won't stop, that's when you call your partner, friends or family who can either help you out or get you to the hospital. I was self-medicating a lot since it felt like this was all just pregnancy taking a toll on my body. I exercised more to boost my energy. I was only eating clean foods, things like plain rice, crumpets, no spices or seeds. It helped my bloating a little, but I'm worried about the baby getting enough nutrition. Your baby will be fine, I promise. We have plenty of tests that can help check your blood levels and supplements to regulate any deficiencies. But let me assure you, your baby is fine. What's important now is getting you into remission and managing your symptoms in the meantime but I'm still unsure. How do I know if it's just harmless pregnancy symptoms making me feel ill or if it's my colitis? I wouldn't say any of it's harmless, Falsia. Many women suffer from severe constipation and nausea all throughout their pregnancy, but that doesn't mean they aren't allowed to seek treatment and relief for it. People with chronic pain can still seek approved medication and therapy to manage their own symptoms. People with depression are still allowed to seek safe relief, irregardless of pregnancy hormones. People with Crohn's or colitis are still allowed to continue treatment while carrying a child. Just because you're pregnant, it doesn't magically end your IBD discomforts. At any point, you're allowed to seek medical or immediate care. Any employer, friend, family member, or stranger who tells you to just tough it out has no idea what they're talking about. You have every right to feel comfortable throughout your pregnancy and throughout your flare-ups. And we're here to help you with that. Now, are you going to let me help you get better? Oh, I suppose I can allow that. <laughs> <laughs> Once we've got a bit more fluid into you, would you like me to go to the canteen and get you something nice? Oh, those little fruit pots are to die for. Then a fruit pot you shall have. 
And there we go. How do I unscare this? Oh, crumbs, how do you stop sharing? <laughs> Found it. All right. So that's just one of six comics which are free for anybody to read. Um, it was very, it was a wonderful experience, honestly, to get to present medical text in something quite as fun as a comic. And I'm hoping that that means it's going to make it a lot more accessible for the general public to not only read and access, but also find maybe a little bit of enjoyment in. Uh, and now we're going to move on to Paul Stringer's documentary. Uh, he uh, took the time to interview just about everybody and get uh, the side of things from the research angle and from the artistic angle. Uh, and that is going to be shown to us right about now. Hi, so I'm Helen Steed. I'm a consultant gastroenterologist at the Royal Wolverhampton NHS Trust. We were part of a team uh, with colleagues in Leeds and London and at the University of Wolverhampton uh, looking into um, women's lived experiences with inflammatory bowel disease while they were going through their pregnancy journey. That was really focusing on the, um, the stages of it, so thinking about becoming pregnant, being pregnant afterwards, and then for women who perhaps um, decide that they don't want children or, um, or who aren't able to have children, unfortunately. My role in that was to recruit patients into the, the research study where we interviewed them in depth about their experiences uh, and, and then analysed the, the work and we came up with the results. Part of the, the project on this occasion was to develop something that would be um, patient facing, if you like, after, after the results. And so typically when you undertake a research project you write a paper, you publish it in a journal, you might present it at a, a kind of medical or scientific meeting. Um, and, and yes, there are absolutely patients that engage with that side of it and read it and, and really want to know and have that level of knowledge. Um, but there are other people that will never look at those and, and I don't blame them. Some of them are really dry and we're not probably the sort of most patient friendly when we write work because we write it for each other. And so it can be, you know, all the lay terms are all taken out of it. It was really a need to try and translate our findings back to um, women and their partners because we felt that there were some positive messages that would be reassuring for them. Where the artists came in is that we've worked on a project before where artists represented women's lived experiences um, and, and that went really well and there were some excellent pieces uh, produced and, uh, and there was sort of widespread engagement. So we wanted to repeat that. Where this project's a little bit different is we asked the artists to interpret the results for themselves. So we didn't want to tell them what the findings were. We've given them the, the transcripts for them to actually look at and we've asked them to think what they what comes and stands out to them and what they think is important to to reflect back. I'm Dr. Satvinda Poywal and I'm the lead psychologist on this project. The psychology team are working on analysing the quality data that we have and using that analysis to help inform the artist's work. We know that patients often feel uh, have experienced high level of pregnancy related anxieties and worries. Despite the fact there's loads of really fantastic information out there, for example, Crohn's and colitis do incredibly patient-friendly information sheets. So it's not information that is lacking here, but I think it's perhaps the information available with the facts isn't that great at communicating to patients, telling them what they need to know. Now, art could be great because actually it speaks to patients and perhaps a bit more patient-relevant language so my name is Maggie Ailiff, I'm Head of Wolverhampton School of Art. We were approached by psychology to start with just to see if it was something that we'd be interested in and I think it was a very tentative approach. I think they were a bit worried that the art school might be a bit um, snobby about working on something like this but actually of course it's really key to our practice not just training people with the skills but actually thinking how you apply those skills to to make a difference. I think we've got three uh, wonderful pieces of work for starts. I think I think that what's clear is that uh, the artists have managed to really um, 
you know, take this incredibly complex material, this research, this knowledge of the clinicians and uh, the condition itself and, and the sort of experiences of patients and condense that into these really, uh, I mean, I'm going to say simple because they are, I mean, obviously it's not simple, but they're really kind of simple, beautiful outcomes. I'm Sorrel Mayon. Um, I'm an animation director based in London. Um, my work focuses on the dissemination of scientific knowledge and research. I found the project overall really rewarding and the process, particularly like the beginning of the process where um, I get to storyboard and I go through all the transcripts that um, Becky gave us and going through those and creating all, all my visual ideas and just getting ink and my sketchbook and kind of learning through drawing and diving into that topic. I essentially read through the transcripts um, and as I read through them, I process all the information by rewriting and drawing bits. Do these big pages with ink or a pen and like elements of it is drawn and elements of it is like is written, but you have like bits that I think are particularly important that will be in bigger font and stuff like that. And I, I basically kind of mind map across like loads and loads and loads of different pages. Um, and in doing that, I can kind of pick out the more key elements and also think of ideas as I go. Like it kind of enables me to generate visual ideas. And some of these are actually in the final film. When you have a chronic condition, you're often talking to so many different doctors and looking at so much different information online. Um, it can get pretty intense and confusing. So the fact that this work is based off of transcripts and we and from doctors um, means that people can come to it for a bit of clarity. Um, and I also wanted the film, and hopefully the film does represent a lot of different stories and people. I want people to feel like they're not alone in, in what's what they're going through. Hi there, my name is uh, Jessie Butcher. Uh, I'm a 24 year old illustrator, animator, storyboard artist and writer. Uh, my practice is primarily on character animation, on uh, very character-driven stories, a very expressive, lots of emotion, and big, colourful worlds. The general thing on the project was that we were given a lot more freedom than I thought a project like this was going to give us. I thought it would be very, like, clean medical text, very clean medical illustrations, which, not my favourite, but doable. And then we're suddenly told we're kind of allowed to interpret it however we want. That gave me great freedom because, especially with a medical-based project, you, I think it's very important to involve emotions and personal feelings because uh, we've all had, well, most of us have had a medical experience that's been, you know, maybe even a little traumatic. And yes, you can think about like the physical side effects of all that, but then the mental side effects aren't always talked about. So I was thinking, this is great because now not only can we discuss the medical side of things, we can also discuss the emotional and the mental side of things all in one, which I believe has made it a lot more engaging. One thing that would be really important to touch upon with this project is that when you give artists creative freedom, you get, sometimes you'll get things that don't work because it's a bit like you're splattering paint on a wall. Yeah, and sometimes you'll be like, all right, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. But if you let someone splatter that paint, you're going to get something you never knew that you wanted. And I think that this project has really done that. They've allowed three artists to go a bit crazy in a room. And we've gone back and forth, and a few times they've been like, yeah, you've got to repaint that because that hasn't worked. But what they have got now is something they thought, well, we thought we were going to get it all in green, and you've painted the entire room pink, purple, blue with some glitter on it. And somehow it worked. Hiya, I'm Rachel and I graduated from Wolverhampton University in 2019. I'm a creative communicator who practices in illustration and graphic design. The way in which I've interpreted such emotional stories is actually by trying to use colour, which is something I absolutely love, and kind of taking that in a way that can emotionally calm and relax these individuals. I think also in a way in a lot of what I've done, although it appears very graphic, there's a lot of hand rendered things in there that actually add that emotional touch and that human element. Going through the transcripts, there's obviously a lot of um, personal information. It was all very specific to each individual. And I think I really wanted to add that hand rendered element to kind of subtly show that these are very individual stories, but also, you know, this can be applied to 
any woman living with Crohn's and colitis. I just hope that it just at least gives them a, an insight as to what maybe is necessary for them to continue with family planning, especially with their disease. I think um, if they could just take my artwork and for it to maybe just maybe get thinking about some of these topics or subjects that we're talking about and then hopefully use it as a tool and give them the confidence to then go to their doctor or their nurse to then be able to ask these questions and to maybe to feel a bit more supported in a way that they've got this little booklet that they could then say look no I've you know this is how I feel this has made me think I've got a question surrounding this and I think in the booklet we've got um, a reflections page and the idea of that is for them to just go through the images and go through the little bits of information because it's not all there but a lot of it is there and just get them thinking and I think when you're in a doctor's surgery sometimes you forget maybe what you wanted to say what you wanted to ask so these reflection pages were just really important as a guide and just a little support for them to have the confidence to ask these questions that I guess are so personal about their own health and yeah their children. It's so impressive to see and um, that the work kind of come together and the concepts and the thought that have gone into it. Um, and uh, I think the thing that surprised me is the way they've taken really different um, aspects of it. So there's a lot of, there is overlap uh, between the messaging um, that they, they're producing, but they have gone for, for quite different sort of representations. So the styles are incredibly different. And I think it's interesting how one artist is sort of um, almost sending a message from the healthcare professional's perspective. Another artist is really very much about the, the kind of the family feel and the, the patient's ex perspective outside of the healthcare setting and, and then other artists has gone for something that's sort of a lot more factual in sort of addressing or kind of raising where women might want to look for more information. Where we know we struggle is that we do struggle to engage some people in research itself um, and, uh, and I don't think that we're great at representing those results back to patients and in a, a kind of patient friendly manner that would make sense to the majority of people. And I think where we really thought that art could come into its own is, is creating that visual representation of just some of the key points that you're trying to, to get across. So I really think that art could be a, a way of sort of bridging that gap between research for academics and research being presented to the general public. Hi, I'm Becky. Um, I'm a PhD student in health psychology. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to say what a great experience it's been working with a multidisciplinary team. Everyone has brought their own skills and expertise to an incredible piece of work. And I'd like to say a massive thank you to the artists for creating their amazing work that we hope engages and inspires everybody. As you've heard, it was important for us that we didn't influence the artist's interpretation of the data. And interestingly, they have identified the same, if not um, similar, sorry, if not the same key messages as us, um, what the patients want, <clears throat> what they struggle with, and what they'd like more of. So there is a growing interest in the use of approaches to public engagement with research that use the arts to facilitate engagement. And we are interested in supporting effective ways of engaging IBD patients and the public. Our research aims to enhance public and patient awareness of IBD and family planning, as well as the importance and influence of research. Public engagement has the potential to promote dialogue, critical thinking and exchange of ideas and experiences that are important to stimulate conversations. We wanted to find out if these three very different pieces of artwork promote family planning with IBD by gathering feedback on what people think of the art pieces as a way of sharing research data more informally. As you may have seen in the chat section, I have 
put links to each pieces of art that if you could fill out and um, copy and paste and share and um, to provide as much feedback as we possibly can get on the the artwork people's thoughts on coloring sizing and everything like that purely because um most artworks normally assessed by the experts so the expert within the art field and what we're trying to find out is whether not only is this engagement for the patients but also whether it's a, a very good informative way of providing research information in a way that actually reaches everybody it's more inclusive and um, everybody will be able to access this Another way that we're trying to gather research and um, sorry data is by conducting interviews. So what we're looking at is conducting one to one interviews. So I haven't done so yet, but I will do ask the artists if they will be interviewed to share what inspired them and what the hope the patients got from their artwork and you know what were their key findings that kind of really hit home and how and why. Then obviously we'd like to look at the IBD patients and their thoughts, and obviously um, what the art message, the artist's message, whether that came across to the patients, whether they felt that the artwork will help them prevent um, and or reduce reproductive health space worries, because obviously, as Sati mentioned earlier, that was one of the key things that pretty much nearly all the patients spoke about was some form of worries in different aspects of having IBD and family planning and also we wanted to find out sorry we want to find out whether this will encourage dialogue between patient and healthcare professionals but not just healthcare professionals but also their friends and family and um, potential colleagues and um, you know just being it being a more open acceptable conversation for everybody to have we also did we also do want to speak to the healthcare professionals to see what their thoughts are on the artwork and whether the artwork will encourage or open different kinds of conversations for the healthcare professionals with their IBD patients like Sati mentioned to us um, to you all earlier that obviously we do plan on publicating um, our findings um, in scientific um, papers but the main reason for this research was to make sure that everybody could access this information and we wanted to share it with everybody so I'm gathering quite a lot of data and any help would be much appreciated any thoughts and feedback will be great. Thank you, everybody. Back to you, Christian. Thank you, Becky. And I can only highly encourage you to share your thoughts with Becky, take part in the survey and let us know. It's, it's all a very exciting new field for us. And I think we need to understand how, how this works. So we're now gonna have a, a, a panel and um, I welcome Sati and Maggie, who you both already met back to the panel, but also Joy. Um, Joy, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Hello, so I'm Joy. Um, I'm a mum. I've got a little boy, Frankie, and I've also got IBD. Um, so I was diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease two weeks before I found out that I was pregnant. Um, so I sort of did both at the same time, um, which was a massive learning curve. <laughs> okay. Um, the first question I can answer quite quickly, we are very happy to share the slides of the talks and you've all registered so we got your email addresses so we can share that. But also as um, um, someone has already put it in the chat, all the artwork is available on the Cranston Collects UK website. So if you are interested in looking at things in a bit more detail, look at all the other illustrations, um, just do that at your leisure or if you're a healthcare professional, point your patients towards it. So can I start off by, by asking you, Joy, as a woman with IBD who's been through this, how important is research into this area and, and how should we present results to fellow patients of yours? So when I was pregnant, it was about four years ago. And obviously the first thing you do is jump to Google. And um, 
I think the artworks have been amazing. If some, if I found something like that when I had searched the first time round, I don't think it would have been as scary at all because you met with a lot of information that you've got to sit through and a lot of contrasting information as well. Okay, that's excellent to hear. Um, and we've got one question from Jane, and that's probably from Maggie to start with, and then the others we will chip in. Um, how does art have the ability to influence health? So, Maggie, can I give you that really not so simple question to start with, and let's see what the others think as well. Uh, that's a PhD in itself, I think, isn't it, Becky? But, uh, yeah, um, I was looking at that question, and I suppose... Um, it kind of took me in mind the sort of old kind of feminist adage of the personal is political. And um, it kind of took me back to thinking about uh, some early sort of feminist artworks like uh, Judy Chicago's Woman House or Mary Kelly's postpartum document where artists, women artists in particular, decided that they were going to use art to kind of um, bring forth a, and make conversation around really taboo subjects about menstruation, having babies, or the kind of um, Mary Kelly's piece, very famous for including a dirty nappy in a frame, things like that um, cause lots of kind of upset in the press. But I think it's, it's what it does really, um, is it in telling kind of individual stories, um, they make people feel like they're not alone. And um, there's, there's a shared experience that comes from it. And I think uh, that's what these artworks will do. They're, I'd be really interested to see how people feel about them, but I do think they're very different to kind of more informational kind of NHS kind of leaflets, graphics, things like that, because they're telling stories uh, and I think they're relatable stories. So Sati, can I then get the storytelling um, to you from a psychological aspect, is a story a more powerful way of getting information across than something more factual? Um, I think they're different. I, I think stories are amazingly powerful. And if you think the way we teach kids to learn, the way we learn, we have to learn it in a storied way. So we have to learn how to cross the road and it was told to us in a story way. When we tell stories to each other, we tell them in a story way, the beginning, middle, and end. There's characters, there's conflict, they get resolved. And the way we tell jokes, often in a story way, we learn through stories. For example, any religious text out there when it teaches morality or ethics, it's done within a story way. This is how human beings have communicated. It's one way of communicating to each other is through stories. And stories are really, really powerful. So they convey information, it tells what, what the people need to know, what characters need to know, but they take us through a journey and they give us those experiences that we all relate to. So when you're young and you're a teenager, you learn to love through stories. I was, I went to a girls' school and we used to read, I don't know what to talk about this, but Mills and Boons. And it was having to be in a relationship and loving through stories. You, 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 you learn to love through that. You learn through storytelling. And I think giving people important factual information is, is, is important. We need to know that. We need facts are sacred. I agree. But also there's something very powerful in learning through stories, learning how to cope with stories. And you, we have that, for example, even in looking at EastEnders storyline, when, when they tackle important subjects, for example, domestic violence, and it tends to have an increase in people going to the hotlines. So it's not because nobody knows what domestic violence is. It's not because we don't know what the hotlines are. But learning back that through storied way, it makes the storylines more relatable and you see that in yourself. So I think stories are one of a, a, a very important ways of learning. And I feel they can have a massive impact in how we learn to live better lives, healthier lives. And I feel that we do use it, but not so well. I think, and that's something that team and I are quite keen on doing. Sorry, I don't know where I was going with some of my uh, my, my stuff. Okay, excellent, Sati. Um, thank you for that, and and enjoy. Ultimately, this is aimed at patients and and at you. And have you ever considered art to be a way of communicating about health before? No, I mean. You usually don't, you pick up a leaflet 
and it's got a picture on the front and then you open it and it's paragraphs of text. Um, so no, but I think especially like the film and stuff, it really gets you into watching it. And I think I didn't mind sifting through all the medical terms, but I think there are people out there like my partner, for example, who wouldn't sit there and read for 20 minutes and then come to his own conclusions. He needs the information right there in front of you. And what better way to do it than through an image? So we have a question specifically for you, and I appreciate this is not an easy one, um, <laughs> but it's really quite interesting. Do you think if this artwork had been available to you when you were going through a stressful time with your pregnancy, it would have had an impact on you and changed how you thought about your IBD or how you, um, you know, lived your life at that time? Yeah, I mean, I think initially, yeah, because when you first find out you're pregnant, obviously it's a scary time. But if you're already ill at that moment, you're exhausted, you're fatigued. So looking at something calm and rather than when you Google something, it comes up with statistics and numbers and medical journals. So looking at a piece of art, it's going to instantly calm you down. And I think the comic was brilliant, like taking it from like one picture to the next picture and just reading it. And like um, you say, in like a story, it is more relatable and it calms you down and you're looking at the pictures, you're reading the text, you're not just reading paragraph after paragraph. Um, so yeah, I think it, it probably might have. It was probably been a lot more calmer than, oh my God, look at all this stuff I've got to read now. That's really interesting. And that's a lot of food for thought about what we thought about patient education so far. Um, and I think we probably have to rethink a little bit what we're doing there at the moment and, and offer more um, ways of communicating than the standard um, written information, really. Um, there is um, a question, and I think Maggie might be the best one to start off with this one. Um, how does this type of art differ from standard government health campaigns we may see um, on, on mainstream media, especially on, on television? Um, I think, well, some, some are more arty than others, aren't they, I, I think, but um, I think it's probably possibly in the process of making it. I think uh, one of the things that interests me about this process is I think, and it, it was the element that psychology brought to it in a sense is that there was a space between the, the client and the artist, um, which allowed for a, a kind of, uh, I, I hope it allowed the artists a bit more space and it might be worth asking some of them to, to really author the work. So, um, although the brief was very, very loose, and it was really for them to, to kind of respond to the, the psychology and yes, bring in the information, bring in the knowledge that needed to be imparted, but they had, uh, I hope, a, a kind of great deal of freedom to respond as artists um, rather than just uh, giving very specific pieces of information. Um, so I think it is an interesting question um, uh, and I think there may be something in the authorship of the work. So we know that it's a Sorrel Mill film or a Jess Butcher comic. Um, it, it's not been homogenized into something that looks like everything else. It's still very much their work. Um, and, I, and I feel there's something um, ultimately attractive about that, that you want to engage in it. You want to engage in it as art, not just um, uh, information. I think you make a really interesting point then. I think the artists themselves stressed that earlier quite a lot, that they were given, in a sense, the unedited scripts and the, the, the raw story without that much of an interpretation on it, rather than a clear, um, you know, task, you know. And to be honest, some of that ended up with talk to your doctor yeah. or a healthcare professional about wanting to become pregnant. And that was you know, the key message for us, but we didn't give the instructions, come out with that message and that may we made it more powerful. So I think that is a very interesting concept. Um, we've got 
time for plenty more questions. So um, don't be shy. Um, put it in the chat or the, the questions and answer section. And, um, you know, throw the questions at us. Um, it, we can bring the artist in if you got specific questions for them. That would be very interesting. Um, one interesting aspect is uh, bringing the family in. And um, it is not only the woman itself that you need to, um, you know, look after and, and um, get the information to, but actually um, at least the partner often, or sometimes the wider family. And um, Joy, was that an aspect that mattered in, in your life very much that we needed to convince more than you of what's the right thing to do? Yeah, so obviously a partner, my partner Alex was more worried than me at the time, because obviously I think when you're the one with IBD, you're just worried about yourself. But I know for a fact, if it was anyone in my family, I'd be doing double the amount of research and really trying to help in that way. Um, but yeah, obviously my mum as well was, um, I think you really relate with your mum or other females in your family because they've been through it. Your partner obviously has never given birth. They haven't got a clue what's going on with that. But I think the females in your family, um, they sort of know like what their normal pregnancy things were. So I'd sort of ring my mum and say, you know, oh, this has happened. Do you think it's IBD or do you think it's a pregnancy thing? And she'd sort of be like, ah, pregnancy. But if it didn't happen to her, it was like, right, okay. I'll email my nurse and sort of see what's going on there. That, that's really helpful. Um, and one of the aspects that we find quite challenging in, in getting the wider family is in if that family doesn't have usually much of a connection to healthcare services usually or, um, and that can especially be a problem in, in difficult socioeconomic backgrounds or in, in people with um, an ethnic minority background. And um, sadly, I think we've talked about that before when we're actually trying to reach out to um, different um, groups and trying to get a really diverse uh, group of patients to interview. Do you think that art is the right way for every um, ethnic minority or other group? Or do we need to tailor it individually to different audiences? Is it to me, isn't it? Uh, you're the first yeah. one to ask that. Uh, um, I think it should be culturally relevant. I think the art work should actually be culturally relevant for um, those communities to engage in. I think the fact that ethnic minorities don't engage in research the way we want them to do, what we'd like them to do is probably very similar to how they engage with art. I think the numbers of ethnic minorities going to art galleries is quite low as well. So I think it's probably to do with they don't feel represented within research or within those sort of art exhibitions perhaps, but that's not true for every sort of art form and that's not true for every type of research out there. But it can be a challenge, but I feel that um, uh, uh, there, there are things that we can do to make sure that we try to be as inclusive, inclusive as possible when we're conducting research or when we're creating artwork to make sure that we are making it uh, accessible to all. That um, is quite true. And I think it, it does probably need to be reflected that um, we are looking in, in different localities at different um, ethnic or socioeconomic groups and that we might need to tailor that a little bit and that London is different from the Midlands, the North or Scotland for that matter. And um, we, we probably need to localize our approach where we can. Um, so, I have got little else and other questions, but we would really um, like to take the opportunity to ask more. If there's one question I have for maybe one of the artists, that, um, I can see Jess, maybe I'll start with you, is um, how do you think your research will um, impact on patients? And have you had any chance of having patient feedback directly to you yet? Um. So I've had, uh, I haven't had exact, like someone who has specifically had inflammatory bowel disease and been pregnant or wants to be pregnant. I've not had that feedback beyond uh, sort of grapevine, but I have had a, a nurse um, who specialized in um, uh, infant care really, really heavily compliment my comic about breastfeeding because she herself struggled with breastfeeding and has helped women with breastfeeding and all their issues and anxieties, primarily anxieties. And she said that I captured 
that very complex guilt that comes with struggling with breastfeeding and medication really, really well. And I got to say at the time, as soon as you said that, I was just sort of standing there, just red in the face going, oh, oh, thanks. That's really nice to hear. But I've also had people who have, um, some of my friends who have struggled with depression say that it really helped them to have it portrayed so empathetically um, in a visual sense, because it was like, it was as if they could then put themselves in that position. And it was almost as if they were then being told you know, the things that they needed to hear or the things that maybe they want to hear that would also help them. Um, and the fact that I, I tried very hard to also, I also tried to put myself in that position of, well, if I'm struggling with this, do I want someone to sit me down and give me the blunt flat facts or do I want to be given the facts and, you know, be given, offered a hand to hold and a shoulder to possibly even lean on? And that's what I tried to portray in the work. And I felt, I've seen so far that people have said that, they wish that they had this with their own condition, maybe back in the day when they were getting diagnosed or friends even now saying that they just felt happier reading this, getting the information and not feeling like it was something that had to be so bleak, it could have humanity in it. And that's, I, I, so far, so good is what I have to say. I don't want to toot my own horn too much. And I wanna say, I wanna be as open to people's criticism as possible, because I'd want something like this to be as accurate as we can possibly get it to reach the biggest number of people. Well, that's very interesting, Jess. Can I ask the same question to you, Sorrel? Um, so I found the engagement uh, quite cool on Instagram so far. So there's a couple pages, like, I think it's called Crohn's and Colitis Questions, and they people send in their questions, and every day they post their questions to the community, um, and loads of, they get lots of different answers. Not It's not like medical advice, it's like general people's advice. Um, and it's been nice like connecting with those kind of communities. Um, so they've like been watching the film and liking it. And then a couple of times I've seen um, qu questions from them come up that are, are literally covered in either the film or the comic. So I've been in the comments like, watch this, come here. Um, so I've really liked engaging in that way so far. Um, so, so one question I've got was obviously this makes me now think, what do we need to do as healthcare professionals, maybe Crohn's Clinic UK as a charity in terms of our communication so far? And how long does it take from the first sitting down with the transcripts to coming up with a finished product? Because I, I must admit, as a doctor, I haven't got a clue. If you told me six weeks or six years, I would believe either. Um, so we had... Let me think. I mean, just going through the transcripts, I probably went through the transcripts for about a week. And that was, so that was doing all the drawings, um, but it was also, and finding the information, but it was also like nailing down the key points. Um, but in that, it was also like the Zoom chats with the researchers um, to figure out that I was make sure I was on the right track. Um, and we were kind of, you, you know, on the same, uh, route as to like what the key points were um and then the animation took somewhere between like a month and two <laughs> um okay. it was like over a longer because i've got a disability as well so it was over a longer time frame because i wasn't working all the time um but yeah yeah so it's quite a long thing to produce it takes a long time to produce um yeah so, so one of the things i take from that if we need more of this type of artwork we need to pick the right areas to make it most impactful because you, you can't do 30 of these a year. No, yeah, exactly. And like with the film, you know, I was trying to cover a lot of points. I wanted to get a lot of information in there. So you kind of want to like use, you're using every single second of that film, like to, the, to its advantage, because you've only got a minute and a half to get in so much information. Um, yeah, and it takes a long time. So. It's kind of making sure the information is is correct and you're hitting hitting the nail on the head with it really. That's excellent. And and uh, as Matt have put in the in the chat, we're really, really keen to understand more how this impacts on healthcare professionals and patients. So I think um, we probably need to take this to more of our patients and point them towards it and understand um, what impact is having for them, um, because potentially this could lead to not a shift but an extra avenue a, a second or third pillar in patient communication um, that we might need so
So there's one more question in the Q and A. Let me just have a quick read. Okay. Um, so again, for for Jess and Sorrel, could you comment on the nuances or subtleties within the work that we may have missed um, at first look? Uh, so uh, I I've always found that human expression is it's such a wonderful nuanced way of communication those small little changes in body language and facial expressions or in tone and throughout my um, my comics I've, I've always enjoyed drawing facial expressions even when I was really little I'd always try and make an angry face and then a slightly different angry face to try and show a different side of anger and if you look at the comics, um, just in terms of body language and facial expression, you'll see that it's not just the same smiley face or the same frowny face, like the faces, uh, because they're so different, it makes it more human. I like to believe, even though my style is quite cartoony and not exactly the most realistic thing on the planet. Um, but also I try to portray people's emotional state via the environment in the comics. We've all had like that one book or that one film or something that really stuck with us when we were a little kid. And there would be parts in the film where maybe it was scarier and it would, things would get darker and we'd feel that same feeling only to then come out of it as the character does. And then suddenly we get that experience. So by putting that into the comic, either through the environment or the facial expressions, when we experience the lows and you might even be relating to what the character's going through, you yourself do experience a little bit of a low only to then be taken out of it by the help of others or the the information available to you and then the scene gets brighter the expressions get happier things get more empathetic and then you get to feel that loveliness come out of it and suddenly you're feeling that lovely and you're starting to associate well, maybe cc you know this, this information is good for me this ability to relate is good for me you might even feel a bit more hopeful about your situation or just feel a bit more seen in your own emotional journey and it's not immediately obvious because i didn't want it to be like big neon sights signs of you feel sad now you feel happy i wanted it to be a bit more you get to experience it how you're going to experience it um but if you then look out for those sorts of things, it's something like, oh, hang on a minute, the lighting shifted ever so slightly. So uh, obviously I, I'm not artistically very talented. Looking at this, does this speak to the emotions of the viewer rather than more than that you cognitively work it through in your brain consciously? Does it just go straight to how you feel about it or how does it work from, from your end then? Are you asking if, uh, do I consciously think about how to portray emotion no, no. or are you saying, do I? Um, um, how do you think it works with the viewer? Does the viewer just take up an emotion or do you think the viewer actually thinks like, oh, this phrase looks more friendly than the last one or so? Is it just all on a subconscious level? Well, uh, what I'm hoping for is that it's going to primarily be for people on a subconscious level. I think for people who are in this field, they might see the techniques used and be like, in the same way that if you, you know, hear someone speaking medical jargon, I wouldn't know what it is, but someone else trained and I'd be like, oh, I see what you did there. What I'm hoping, however, is that it is going to be subconscious and it is going to help you go on a bit of a journey of emotions and empathy, the same way that, a, a, you know, a children's film does kind of the same thing. You know, it has those story beats that then then get meat and that's why they're so successful because at the end of the day it's all relating to us and i'd like to relate to other people okay um helen can share with us one of the pages to illustrate the point more poignantly than we can probably put into words can you see that yes you've got two pages up you've got one from my um future fears one and one from my breastfeeding one Yes. Do you want to talk through them, Jess? Sure thing. So yeah. in the Future Fears one, I used the, uh, the uh, which is the one on the left, which is red and kind of greeny blue. I used the, the young woman's hair as an example of how um, anxiety and helplessness and being overwhelmed can emotionally feel. It feels like it's stuck on you and you're trapped in this cycle of it. And I portrayed the medical professional as a light who can try and help break through this. And that's not somebody who takes away those anxieties and those fears and that feeling because no one can take away a mental health concern or anything like that. But I wanted to show people that maybe if you're willing to be open and maybe even a little vulnerable, those people can actually help you pull out of 
that overwhelming state and bring you towards something a bit lighter and a bit nicer. And it's still going to be there, but it's going to become more manageable as time goes on. And that's, I think, the healthiest way of viewing anxiety and mental health concerns. Um, not as an illness, not as like a horrible thing that needs to go away and you're horrible for having it, but as something that can be managed with help. And with the breastfeeding comic, which is the, um, the one of the woman in the purple shirt, uh, she's talking about her guilt of needing medication and breastfeeding a child and all the complications that she had with her birth regard because of her, um, of her inflammatory bowel disease. And it shows her on a very lonely path uh, where she's the only thing alone in this void walking on this path, just her and her baby. And what's not shown here is as the comic goes on, that void slowly begins to fill more and more with color and more and more people get brought into it as her friend, who she's talking to in the comic, starts to explain, hey, I've had experiences like this too. Maybe not the same as yours, but I can really relate. I'm so sorry you're going through this, but I want you to know that you're not alone. I'm here for you. And visually, we get to come out of the dark and out of the blandness and into a more bright, colorful, together situation. And the darkness, again, doesn't go away, but the darkness is filled with wonderful things that you can focus on rather than just the darkness. So it's not clear, it's not super obvious, but I'm hoping that it can work as a metaphor that works with you subconsciously. Excellent. That was a fascinating insight in how you came up with the work and why. Um, Thank you. Maybe I can go to Sorrel now and um, pose the same question on on subtleties like this that, that make your art work that um, the non-artist may miss. Yeah, so in terms of uh, the kind of subconscious elements with the, with the animation, you don't just have the visuals, but you have the sound as well. So I think like there's kind of the music can go into your subconscious and make you feel different things at different times. Um, but also the kind of subtleties in the animation that maybe you would miss on the first viewing is like the fact that, and actually someone's pointed this out in the chat, the fact that um, I've, made, I've tried to make it as inclusive as possible. I've included people from different ethnic backgrounds and also queer couples, straight couples, polyamorous couples. Um, and also like things like the medicine that I draw in it is that is the actual, what the actual pills look like. You know, it's all very, um, it's, it comes from total fact. Um, and like there's like the stoma bag at the beginning, um, nuances like this that you might not notice. Um, and then in terms of like lighting and things, you've got the like the couple bit with the queer couple in the house. Um, it's nighttime, so everything's kind of dark and cozy. And I wanted that to really represent like how your partner can help you like through these times so much. Um, and then at the end as well, where there's the single woman and she doesn't want to have kids and she's a little bit like uh, jarred out by all these pregnant people around her and all these couples. And then it zooms out and you've actually got loads of different couples going through those different things. And then she relaxes and everyone's kind of in, the, they have their own situation, but they're supporting each other. Excellent. So we've got an interesting question from, from Lyndon and specifically for the artist. So we'll, we'll stick with Solon and go back to Jess. Um, what made you choose to get involved in this project? Have you had any personal experience of medical situations or have you come across IBD before? Um, so how did you, you end up getting involved in a sense? Well, what's interesting is I really didn't know that much about IBD until I began, I started uh, applying for this project. And then I was, I, I kind of, I think as a lot of people do, I assumed that IBD was just like IBS, but a little bit worse, mm -hmm. which, it's not, it's entirely different. And now I'm there going, oh crumbs, I was completely ignorant, but I didn't know because this was, I just, it never occurred to me to ever look this kind of thing up. And, uh, but that's not the reason why I was picked. I was picked, I believe, because um, I, I was the only, I was one of the only people to offer a comic, which I don't think had been offered before. There'd been other things. Uh, the reason I decided to go for it though, is because I have personally found wonderful 
wonderful help for, uh, in terms of medical help from reading people's stories and especially reading people's comics. Um, I don't have physical illnesses, but I do have mental health issues. And there were times I remember when I was especially very young, where I felt very alone with those issues because it, it wasn't exactly spoken about or if it was spoken about, it was very blunt and it was very much like, this is how you stop it. And that's all you need to focus on. And at the time, that isn't necessarily what I needed. I just needed to be able to relate to somebody on an emotional level. But then I found people online who were talking about their own, you know, their journeys and their and their experiences. People who were drawing art, like illustrating how their illnesses uh, manifested to them. And I would look at that and go like, oh, that's me, that's me. I have this very vivid memory of um, actually a, game, a, a video game player who would just stream video games, talking about his experience with obsessive compulsive disorder. And I remember listening to it over and over and over again. I didn't know why, but deep down I realized it's because I related to it so heavily. And it was just him saying like, yeah, I was in college, you know, and this happened. And, and so when I found out, wait, we can, help people in a medical sense and it suddenly just dawned on me how wonderful would it be if I could then provide something that could reach out to someone who was like me when I was younger who felt alone emotionally with this illness and then suddenly you get to read something maybe see yourself in it and suddenly you're just there going all oh, the lights are in my head and yeah you don't immediately and everything's fixed but suddenly you've got an anchor and you don't feel like you're by yourself and if that even reaches one person then that's wonderful and it's worth me putting my time into. Excellent, that sounds fascinating. And um, before we come to, to Sora and why she got involved in it, I just wanna ask Joy, um, when you hear stories like this, why artists get involved, how does that make you feel? How does it make you feel related to the art? I think it's really special because I think Obviously, if I hadn't been invited to this and I'd have just seen a leaflet, you sort of assume that um, the artist is just told, right, this is what we want, this is how it's done, da, da, da. the fact that they've like, listened to transcripts and really taken in what people living with this condition are feeling, thinking, and the, also the important medical bits that need to be in there, and they've composed it all together into one thing and took their turn on it. I think it's really good. Excellent. So, Sorrel. Um, same question as to Jess, what made you choose to get involved? Um, so firstly, I just really love doing this kind of work. This is kind of my field. Um, working with research is something I absolutely love to do. Um, and making art that supports people is like just the best feeling. I think it's just the best thing to do with your art. Um, but also get I kind of got involved with this project specifically because I've got endometriosis and there's nothing like this for endometriosis. Um, you know, the fact that this many doctors and researchers uh, care enough about the patients to, to, you know, produce this art um, was absolutely amazing. And I've been that person sitting in those, I mean, literally last night, sitting on the medical journals, trying to find out information about my own condition and kind of failing. And if I'd had, you know, if I had a comic or a film about it, um, it would be so useful. So I really believe in, in what it provides for people. That's really interesting. And the thanks for, for being both you and, and Jess so open about sharing your own stories there. That um, uh, it's very generous of you. It makes it very relatable. Um, if we go back to Maggie and, and think about art as a form of, of communicating and communicating, you know, often complex research findings, what type of research do you think lends itself to be represented this way, Maggie? Um, good question. <laughs> uh, I think it is, I mean, I mean I'm kind of interested in it very broadly um, as a school of art, you know, obviously, um, you know, people do do sort of sometimes see art as something that's a nice to have a kind of a, uh, but not that essential. Um, and I think uh, we forget how kind of important it is to all of us, really. You know, what it's absolutely embedded in, in everything that we do. Um, so I think um, it's a, yeah, you know, it's a communication tool, it's a way of talking, it's a way of raising conversations. Sometimes I think it can tackle 
difficult subjects and in you know it's the sort of uh I get I guess one of my fears when we first started the first project was that we'd end up with lots of kind of uh very kind of bodily visceral sculptures and uh, and actually what all the artists did was was kind of create very beautiful things to talk about something that um as Helen said I think in her introduction you know it, it it's not something that most people want to talk about um, so they found a way of um, creating uh, easy conversation, easy ways of sharing uh, difficult subjects with other people, something you could share with your mum, you, you know, have a look at this. Uh, the first project was very much um, looking at how you could, you could introduce difficult subjects to a community that perhaps wouldn't recognise these difficulties. So um, I don't... I don't think there's, uh, yeah. Is there any research we couldn't do? I think, um, I think, I think you have to find as an artist, you've probably got to find a way of understanding the research. And I think what the psychological uh, element did, the transcripts, was they gave us a vehicle to understand um, the research, if you like. I think if we'd just given people, and I don't know, but Sorrel and Jess would think, but if we'd just given you the medical papers, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what we would have got. <laughs> so it was, it was it, so, so that there's a process that we're developing here, I think, which is, um, yes, there's lots of amazing and difficult research out there that's talking about really important things. How do we translate that into something that everybody can engage in? Art certainly can play a part in that, but it probably does need, um, you know, we, we as artists need a way into it as well. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's what came from uh, Sati's research in a way. She gave us a, a, a kind of, she opened the door a little bit. Um, and so, so yeah, you, it's, 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 yeah. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question very well. Oh, no, I think you've got a good puzzle. Sorry for the smile, that wasn't at you, that was at Helen's cat invading her <laughs> office. Um, I'm glad my dog didn't see that. Um, I think one really important point that, that comes from art maybe as a way of communication is um, Helen, Matt and I are all involved in, in trying to get people to um, take part in bowel cancer screening, just in the general population and prevent people dying unnecessarily from bowel cancer that can be prevented. And there's different ways of, of checking for it. And, you know, one method is slightly more accurate than the other one. But I think the biggest difference on a population level is to get the uptake up and clearly looking at different ways of communicating is probably sometimes more important than fine tuning the medical interventions we've got. And I think that's, that's a message for probably all the healthcare professionals tonight that we need to get the communication right. And sometimes simple interventions, well communicated, do a lot more than perfect interventions done for very few. Matt, can I come to you? Um, because we've been asked how these comics will be made available to hospital and clinics and via Crimes of Facts UK. And clearly you as the, the senior lead on the research team that we're all involved in have worked quite hard on the um, distribution plan for the results. So maybe you can talk us through what the plans are there. Um, Helen, do you want to go? And I'm not sure Matt had hurt me actually. He froze. Oh, there you go. Uh, Matt, can Sorry. you hear me? Yeah, thanks, Christian. Sorry, having Perfect. some slight. Thank you, you now. I'm going to blame my children who are online gaming. Um, so, uh, thanks, Christian. And thank you for chairing this evening's event. And I, I, you know, it's um, really important, I think, that we acknowledge all the people that have been involved. I'd like to thank people who've joined us, um, but particularly um, going back uh, quite a long time now, the project was led by myself and Sati initially, and, and we were funded by CCUK, and I think it's really important we acknowledge the funders. Um, I, I, it's really important that we make the best uh, possible use of the resources we're given to undertake this type of research in the interests of the patients. 
uh, and I'm hoping that we have had the opportunity to do this. It's been enormously uh, rewarding working with the artists, the arts team at the University of Wolverhampton, and I thank them both of them for, for all their work. I know the artists have spent a huge amount of time on this project. Um, we, we're really learning, I think, on the job here, um, and, and um, we, we haven't used this uh, as much as an opportunity to create impact from research in the past, um, but we, we understand that the, um, the way that this is developing, it's certainly a novel way uh, to interact with patients, uh, and we hope that this will improve the penetration and impact of research for our patients and participants in the future and help us to, to make that information that we get out of research more accessible. And so that's where Becky's project comes in and she'll be uh, uh, linking in to some of you already through the chat and also we'll be sending you uh, emails with the links to fill out any of the um, uh, feedback forms uh, from each of the pieces of artwork and we'll be taking that uh, artwork uh, those feedback forms um, uh, wider so we can get more more information on that and as Becky's mentioned already there'll be some uh, interactions with the artists so we'll be doing some interviews uh, to look at this and evaluate it further so I think as a clinician involved in the research it's been an enormously rewarding experience a lot of the research that we do is written up in a paper and that's that um, but this has been one of the most exciting projects I've been involved with and that's been largely down to the interaction with the arts team and with the artists um, so uh, so thank you everyone for all the work you've done on this project thank you so much Matt and um, to highlight um, that all the artwork is already available as we said on the Cronson Collectors UK website um, Matt, Helen and myself will reach out to other colleagues working in the field, highlighting what is available, what we have done and, and try and, you know, promote this through the professional channels that we've got on the professional networks amongst uh, gastroenterologists, IBD nurses, but also along the um, obstetric um, networks. Um, so hopefully that people become aware of the excellent work that has been done. Um, I really want to strongly encourage you to um, get involved um, if you can and spare some time for putting in the, the uh, feedback service for Becky, I think that would help us understand much more whether we're um, barking up the right tree here and um, we are all very excited, but we need some constructive feedback to see that we're not getting carried away with ourselves. Um, um, but this is potentially an interesting new avenue of communicating with patients and healthcare professionals for that matter. Um, there are no further questions, so I really would like to thank you all for your time tonight. Um, I hope you found it as rewarding as I have. I would like to thank everybody who was involved in the research, thank all the artists, um, the great collaboration at the University of Wolverhampton there, that is really much appreciated. And um, sometimes at NHS clinicians, that is um, beyond our expectations, what we get from work with partners sometimes, and that was uh, really encouraging. Um, and without further ado, then, thank you very much. I'll leave you to enjoy the rest of your evening and um, please provide us with some feedback. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.